So uh, my lab is the genomics and machine learning lab, and we focus on genetics uh, technology, especially single cell and spatial. And we try to use these two types of data to address the uh, key questions in uh, disease, especially in cancer. So uh, for the work today, I will focus on integrating sequencing data and imaging data. And I try to show that uh, by integrating these two types of big data, we can really improve the model performance. And we also can solve some of the problems that might not be able to solve by using only one data type alone. So let's get started. Um, so we have uh, this concept of spatial cellular pathology. And uh, this concept, we believe it, it can be like a second generation of the uh, pathology that are, are in practice now. So if we think uh, of the traditional pathology, this has been around for more than 100 years. And uh, the, the image here is showing, uh, is showing the doctors and the trained pathologists are looking at a cancer tissue section under the microscope. And uh, this is actually a really effective way of telling what disease um, state uh, that's happening inside the tissue. Um, the the very well-trained pathologists will be able to do that really well. However, we know that there are many things that our eyes cannot observe. For example, when we see the tissue, we cannot uh, predict the gene expression inside the tissue. So if we just base on the visual feature, uh, we are missing quite a lot of information to assess the disease condition in there. So that is the traditional pathology. It's still happening every day in the, in the clinics. Um, so in uh, 2017, um, there's a first uh, FDA approval uh, for the application of AI in uh, the digital pathology. So this is a very good uh, side of, uh, 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 of, of uh, real life application for this field. And my, my team, we, we, we are introducing uh, this uh, concept called cellular pathology uh, for cancer, because we think that uh, in cancer, we need to look at the cell and, and, and the tissue. Um, so why is that? Is it because uh, cancer is a very, very complex tissue? Like we can see here in this uh, picture, uh, there's a combination of many different cell types uh, like we, we can appreciate here different cell color and shapes and cells they don't act alone they actually act as a community as an ecosystem and they do interact so if uh, we are um, uh, to use one drug that uh, target this whole system uh, we, we might be very prone to failure uh, or we may be successful but for a, a subset of cases so that means that we then need to look at this whole uh, complexity uh, using different uh, suitable type of data. Um, however, the technology uh, to measure this uh, the, the, are quite expensive. They are available now, we can do it, we can measure the whole tissue like this, and then we can predict the interaction, we can identify the cell types. I will show some example of that today, but they are quite expensive. And I think that machine learning is, is a solution that we, we can bring that use of the technology to uh, to to every patient. So uh, the the main aim of my team is that uh, we try to fight uh, cancer uh, one cell at a time, and we try to do that for every patient. That means that uh, the the data need to be very high resolution, and uh, it need to be very scalable and cheap and fast. Um, so uh, we believe that by, by machine learning, we, we are making steps closer to that aim. Um, so uh, when we think about traditional machine learning for the histological imaging data, uh, we, we, we can see that uh, the, the model rely a lot on the labels uh, from the human labels. So uh, often we need about 50,000 images like this with the labels and uh, big company might be able to afford that. Actually big companies are doing that um, uh, with a very well trained a team, big team of pathologists that can look at the tissues and label different parts of the tissues. And then uh, the machine learning model can be used to, to train that kind of data to, to, to make the prediction from the HNE image. So um, our team, because we don't have that 
that kind of big resource to do that human level big data training. We, we rely on spatial uh, model in the sense that uh, we, we can uh, uh, have a much richer type of labels data and we don't need much a bigger uh, data set, uh, but we can still make the prediction really well. Um, and and th that is the, the, the general approach. So uh, I will start with uh, giving a first example of how powerful that kind of approach is. So uh, starting with uh, just using one gene. So the approach is to use uh, the expression of one protein to label the image so that we don't just uh, use the H&E image, but we also use the protein expression data. And, and, and this is actually what's happening in, in the clinics uh, very routinely that uh, the doctor uh, um, look at the, the H&E image like this. And in this H&E image, there are two, two colors. The blue color indicate the cell nuclei, uh, and the pink color indicate the, the, the cytoplasm in general. So it will allow the doctor to tell how big or how small what shape of the cells and how the cell uh, distribute across the tissues. And that, that kind of features allow the doctor to tell uh, quite a lot of useful information about the cancer. And then the doctor can follow up with uh, asking the pathology lab to do one or two more staining. So each, each staining like this uh, is, is kind of confirmation information for the doctor. Uh, now, this kind of data is available. So our idea here was that we try to combine this data with this data and build the machine learning model on that uh, with the idea that uh, we, by combining this data with this, we have a very high level of, uh, of, of, uh, of labels for each pixel in, in the image and, uh, and, and the model can then be, be, be trained uh, at the pixel resolution. So, so th this is our pipeline. So uh, we got paired image. Uh, the uh, P53 is the uh, cancer marker, protein markers, uh, appear as a brownish color in here. And then the H&E image, that's our input. So, um, uh, and then we have a quite small data set. Um, um, but for each data set, uh, we have a very high resolution image. And then from there, we, 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 we can do this uh, label transferring. So we can map the PA53 standing to the H&E image. And by doing that, we have uh, uh, the label for every single pixel. So that, pic uh, that pixel will have a, a P53 positive or P53 negative, and that through millions of pixels. And then we, we can split that image into many smaller ties. Uh, for, for each tie like this, uh, uh, we, we, we have the, the label for that ties. And then we can train the, the, the machine learning model. Uh, in, in this uh, case, uh, it's, it's uh, quite a standard model where, where we, we started with. Um, so the key innovation in, in this pipeline is the transferring of the label, P53 stain label to the H&E image so that we can combine what our eyes cannot see, that is the expression of P53, and what our eyes can see, that is the H&E image. And then from there, we, we make the prediction of cancer or non-cancer region. Um, so, uh, and the model worked quite well. So this is the, the, the uh, testing for the uh, TCGA data. So that completely independent data set. And uh, we can see the classification of uh, uncertain um, uh, in, in, in the middle appearing uh, yellow here and, uh, and uh, the certain uh, classification as cancer or non-cancer. And then we can see that our classification, for example, this part here at the cancer part uh, with high level of uh, certainty, that's uh, consistent with the pathological annotation as the green line in here. So uh, so this is the first example. It's, uh, it's like a baby step where we only look at one, one gene and we hope that we can train the model that can do classification for us and it does produce quite a reasonable result. Uh, but we wanted to do much, much more than that. Um, so we wanted to have uh, like thousands of genes. Uh, in fact, uh, almost any gene possible uh, yeah, that, that uh, in the tranquitomes, and the, 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 the technology now allows us to do that. So uh, the technology called spatial tranquitomics. In this case, we, we show an example of 10x genomics uh, the, uh, technology where we have a, a TCU block. We section the tissue and then the doctor can uh, uh, annotate that tissue as, as normal. But the new, uh, the new information there is this uh, gene expression information. It comes from sequencing. 
So that means now we have uh, the data that allow us to combine sequencing information with imaging uh, information. And I think uh, as, as the audience uh, uh, in here are uh, well aware that uh, these two type of information are, are, are real big data. So um, for the gene expression data, we have a, a table like this, where the genes are, are shown in rows like this. A row is one gene, and the column in here is a spot. So I will mention about spot a lot in the subsequent slides. So a spot like this uh, uh, is one unit of measurement. And that unit of measurement is independent from other spots. And it has around 3,000 genes that are non-zero. Um, in total, uh, this table here represents the whole transcriptome. So that means that uh, this uh, the data set here from uh, breast cancer is representing the, the, the whole uh, transcriptome of, uh, of the, the uh, human uh, um, uh, the cells. So, uh, and uh, uh, the color here show different cell types. And this cell type uh, come purely from uh, clustering of the of the uh, data, so it's uh, data driven. We don't need a pathologist to label the the data for us. Um, and uh, as as a traditional HNE um, pathological grade uh, image, uh, we we have uh, the pixel information here. So that means that uh, from one sample, we have uh, three types of data. So. Uh, sequencing data, imaging data, and we can also ask for pathological annotation. Uh, so that is a, a real rich data type that we can use for chain model. Um, now, the, so th th that kind of data is, uh, uh, is, is, is useful in, in the sense that we have a uh, thousand of genes and we also have uh, the, the images of the tissue, so we know the morphology of the cells. And then we also have the distance between the, 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 the spots. So that means that if we know how to combine these three types of information, we can understand much more about the, the biology of the, of, the, of the cancer. So in this case, I'm showing uh, a, a range of uh, different types of analysis that we can do to understand the biological insights that's happening uh, within the tissue. Uh, but for the purpose of this talk, I will just focus on the machine learning part. Um, so using that data, um, we can come up with a, a neural network model where we have an input uh, as a image uh, data and gene expression data uh, using uh, the autoencoder, for example, to uh, extract the latent space representation of the input. And then we can combine the latent space and we can use that uh, combined uh, uh, representation to do classification. Uh, that is one like, kind of simple idea where we can use uh, combined very different types of data, imaging and sequencing data together. Uh, and we can come up with variants of, of the model. For example, we can just uh, uh, use the uh, dimensional re reduction uh, methods in here. And then uh, from there, we, we can just combine the two inputs and then have uh, the fully connected layer to do the classification of the, of the disease. Um, so. Uh, uh, this uh, combination worked really well. So we show that uh, the performance uh, of the model when we combine the, 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 the two, uh, two type of data uh, is, is much uh, better than uh, only one type of data. So it can uh, avoid the false positive like we see here, but it also increase the true positive. And uh, quantitatively, we, we can see uh, like this. So um, the combined model clearly perform much better than the, the, the model that only use one type of data. Um, and uh, this is uh, the model where the input is the spatial transcriptomics. That means that uh, for the model to work, we need two types of input, uh, the imaging information and the measurements from uh, the spatial check of the mixed, uh, uh, um, experiment. That means that it's very, it's very uh, uh, costly. It's, uh, it's not possible to apply that in, in real life uh, scenario. Um, uh, so we, we, we then um, uh, go uh, a step further than that. And, and, uh, and, and that is uh, to, to, to just do like a small, small set of spatial transcriptomics and then uh, get a model and then apply that model to unseen um, um, uh, h and &E image without the, the spatial transcriptomics data. And uh, we also go down to uh, 
a single cell resolution. So uh, we, we, we have this technology called Xenium, and this technology allows us to uh, measure like about 500 genes per cell, and this is the resolution of a cell in the tissue. So across the whole tissue, we, we can uh, uh, classify the cells like this. Every single nuclei, we have one label. So that allows us to have a, a really rich uh, type of, uh, of model uh, the, of, of, the day, of, uh, of the training data set for the model. So, uh, uh, and this, this is uh, uh, an example of that. So a very small part of the tissue, but we can uh, have uh, the cell type that annotated. Every dot in here is one cell type and uh, 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 correspond to uh, the cell. Each dot is, is a HNE and image. So that means that we have uh, um, like millions of data points with labels. Uh, specific to the cell types. And this type of data is unprecedented because uh, if by, by eyes uh, we try to do this, uh, it's almost impossible to label like 5 million of, of cells, 5, 5 million of single nuclei like this. But, uh, but through the technology, we, we can generate this data within like two days. Uh, then we, we, we could have uh, enough data for uh, millions of cells. And then uh, if, if we uh, run um, about 20 uh, samples, that allow us to have a, a, like a, at least uh, a 10 millions of cells. Uh, each, each cell has its own label and the image. So that is really like uh, a new type of data that are now available for us to do the classification. And, and, uh, um, and, and, and uh, we, we applied a, a model uh, called Hovernet model. So, the, so this is not our model. It's, it's public before, but just apply for the for the H and E image. Now we apply that for the Xenium data um, and make use of the labels that 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 we got from the the data uh, to to train the rich uh, the data set. So the idea is that uh, we use the uh, the 500 uh, the number from 500 genes to classify every individual cells uh, into its own cell type. And then, uh, for given an HNE uh, image, uh, we can uh, segment the, the, the image into nuclei. And then that nuclei now has its own label. And then uh, we, we can use uh, the Hovernet model to do both segmentation, so from one stream in here, and then classification from another stream. Um, and uh, we, we can then evaluate the, the, the models. So th this work has been uh, led by, by, by three uh, students in, in my team, and uh, it's a very uh, recent work, and uh, we're very excited about uh, how, how, how well the, 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 the technology is. It, it still requires a lot more uh, optimization, but uh, we, we have a, some very good idea of how, how to make the model better. But uh, with the current model already, we can see that the classification of the cells, like in here, the color, um, uh, it's, uh, same color, I mean, the same cell types. And then we can see that uh, it classified uh, very, very well at the single living eye level. Um, when we go down to the quantity, uh, the uh, confusion matrix doesn't look impressive. It's, it's, it's in encouraging, but it's not impressive yet. But uh, when we think about the, the structure of the whole tissue, uh, here is the whole tissue, how uh, the ground shoes look like this, and then the predicted um, uh, tissue look like this. And the, this data just come from the pure H&E image. So that, that's already like a, a, a really useful way to, uh, to find the pattern of, of, of the cell distribution and how the cancer tissue look like in the, at the single cell resolution. Um, and this is another example. So we tested the model across uh, quite many samples and we observed uh, uh, similar uh, results that uh, the global structure and distribution of the cells in the cancer tissue look uh, very, very consistent between the ground truth and the prediction. And when we come down to the single cell resolution, it also uh, uh, very good uh, in, in general. Um, and uh, we also uh, look at the uh, interpretability of the model, uh, since uh, this is uh, the, the application in the clinics that is the, our ultimate aim. So uh, interpretability is in, in important. So uh, in here we look at the latent space, and uh, from the latent space we could uh, separate out the, the cells uh, the quite well. So suggesting that our latent space uh, contain uh, useful biological biological information. 
And then we also uh, have a measure for uncertainty measure. Uh, so uh, the, in the, here, the entropy measure, if we see the red color, that is the part, uh, the nuclei that we are not so confident in predicting. And then uh, for, for transparent uh, or blue color, that is where we are very uh, confident for that particular prediction. Um, um, so that is uh, the, 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 the part where we do the classification of the cells. Essentially, that's what the, the, the doctor and uh, pathologist try to do, uh, looking at the image and tell the cell types. But we want to do further than that. We want to predict the gene expression, which is a much more uh, challenging task. Um, and uh, the idea is that we make use of this like abundant uh, uh, amount of uh, HNE and image that's uh, in the clinics already. And then from that HNE and image, we try to predict the gene expression. So uh, th this is uh, an example of that. So if we, based on just this HNE and image, we predict the expression, red means really high, and then green mean low, um, then we can see that the predicted pattern and the uh, observed uh, pattern here are very consistent. Um, so observed pattern means the, the real data that we measure from the experiment. So th that would be the idea. And, uh, and this really allows us to scale up the application of spatial chunk atomics. So it costs around like $5 to generate this and, uh, and uh, about half an hour to get this data. But to, to get this data, it takes much longer time. Um, and more costly. So how, how do we do that? So we, 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 we wrote our own model. So in this, um, uh, we, we wrote a software called ST image. And in this software, we perform a series of quality control where we um, uh, normalize for different image quality. Uh, we remove the, the ties that are, are not uh, high quality. And uh, after that, we, we, we have a, a neural network model. So the, uh, uh, the unique part of our neural network model is the line in the uncertainty quantification and uh, interpretability. So uh, uncertainty quantification is uh, when we make the prediction, we don't predict one fixed value point, but we predict the range of the value and with the uh, probabilistic assignment of uh, the distribution of the value that we predict. In this case, we, we, we use a negative binomial distribution. So for every single gene, we, we can predict the two parameters for the distribution of that gene. Um, and, uh, this is uh, how, how the model performs. So uh, the, 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 I'm showing two examples. And uh, for the interpretability of that, I also show the pathological annotation. So this is the prediction of the COX-6C. So that is the gene marker for cancer. And we can see that uh, in the predicted value, it, it matches really well to the cancer region in here as annotated as tumor. And then uh, down here is also uh, the uh, Expressed really high in the orange uh, region, and that's uh, annotated as a cancer region. And uh, we also uh, perform uh, the, uh, the feature attribute um, uh, analysis, where we go back to the original H and E image and ask uh, which part in that image uh, contribute to the uh, prediction. And in this case, we use the LAM model, uh, which is uh, quite a common method that people use for the uh, explainability. Um, and uh, we tested the model across different type of data. So, so that data could be from frozen, fresh frozen sample or fixed samples and from high versus low quality samples. So uh, we, we tested that and, and it's very robust. Um, and uh, we also tested for non-spatial data. So this is from the TCGI data set, um, completely independent uh, data, no spatial information. We can ask the pathologist to help with annotating the cancer region versus non-cancer region. And we can see the expression of the COX-6C is really high in the cancer region, uh, but not in the non-cancer region. So that indicating that the, the model is working quite well. Um, um, and we have a, a, a measure of the uh, uncertainty. So because here we predict the negative binomial distribution of the gene, so that means that uh, we can uh, get the measure for the variation of the mean value and the, uh, the, the diversion the values. Uh, and uh, from there, when we do the uh, ensemble approach, then we can calculate the variation of the mean and then the mean of the variation. So the variation of the mean uh, tell us uh, whether our model can capture the, the, the change in the data out of the distribution. And then 
uh, the mean of the variation tell us whether we can capture the variation within the data and some of those vari vari variation we, we, we don't know. And uh, by, by measuring that, uh, we, we, we have a much more confidence in terms of, of how, how well we, we predict our, our, our data. And then we can tell whether this gene is predictable or not. Um, so we also came up with a new um, approach where we can increase the robustness of the, of the model. So that is ensemble approach. So we initialize the model like 100 times, and then we take the mean of that uh, value. Um, and uh, uh, we can see that um, uh, this is the, the result, the line in here is the result from the ensemble model. And uh, the box plot here shows uh, uh, the, the, the single value of the model, then we see that uh, in, in either case, like two types of samples, we, are, we, are, we got the line uh, from ensemble much higher than the median of, of, the, of, the, of the, the model performance. So uh, suggesting that uh, our, our ensemble um, approach make the model more robust and also improve the performance. Um, and uh, we also uh, look at the predictable genes. So um, uh, with the, with the uh, assumption that not every gene uh, can be predicted. And uh, here we look at the uh, different databases that uh, list the different uh, genes that are essential for the, 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 the cells and cancer as a disease. And uh, from there, we, we can test uh, how many of the genes uh, that can be predicted. And we, we can see that, uh, that for the uh, a subset of the gene, the performance of the model is really high uh, compared to the remaining set. So uh, that can be applied to the gene panel later uh, in, as, as in, in the clinics. So uh, to sum, sum up, so I presented to you like the, the approach where we can in integrate the sequencing and imaging data together, then that improve the model performance. Uh, even when we use one, one gene only, uh, it already show uh, acceptable performance. But uh, the spatial tectomics allows us to do thousands of genes, and that opens a huge, uh, huge potential for us to do both uh, cell type classification and the prediction of the gene expression matter. And eventually, we hope that it will uh, help us to achieve our aim of uh, scaling up uh, this application to many people because we can use just the H&E image. So uh, I'd like to finish by thanking my team and uh, the, these people are all the uh, person who, who, who done all the work and that they're very creative, energetic, and we, we're looking for a bioinformatician. Uh, and and uh, the, the, the the new person who joined our team will work uh, a lot with uh, with the clinicians and uh, and you may be invited to to the operation theater and uh, I, I I was one that uh, if I visited that I tried not to be painted out by the clinician but they they really want to collaborate because they see this kind of approach might might bring a uh, potential benefit to. To patients so please come and, and chat to me or email me if, if you are interested in joining us and thank you very much for your attention thank you Khan, for the wonderful talk and it's a great incentive to join his lab um yes do we have questions for Quan? thank you so much for your fascinating talk it was great you had you had uncertainty you had interpretivity you had calibration which is great yeah. Uh, when you are fusing multimodal data, you can do it in early stage, in intermediate, or in the later stage. So, what do you think? Which stage can be the best? And the, the second question is: yeah. uh, the imaging data and the sequencing data they are interested. Uh, they are different in terms of uh, data scale, in terms of the content yeah. and the data structure. So, mm. how did you handle the data heterogeneity as well as the data uh, scale? in your deep learning model? Yeah, yeah, the, the, these are two great questions. So uh, for the application, we aim at uh, early uh, the diagnosis and prognosis uh, uh, applications. So uh, for example, in, in breast uh, cancer, we try to look at the risk of uh, progression from in situ to metastasis. Uh, and then for the skin cancer, we look at the, the risk of uh, going from uh, melanoma in situ to metastatic melanoma. So, so the, those are some of the questions that with the rich data like spatial uh, data, we, we, we will be able to answer. Uh, and for the uh, second part of the question, um, so uh, the imaging data and, and uh, sequencing data, as you said, is very, very different. 
Uh, so the way that we, we combine in, in this is uh, uh, through the neural network with uh, extracting the representation in the latent space and optimize the latent space so that, for example, in the case of autoencoder, we can reconstruct the input. Um, and before that, we do uh, careful uh, normalization. For example, for the images, we do have a, a, a default step to normalize between images to, uh, to re reduce technical bias due to the stain intensity. Uh, and then uh, we also, also do the scaling as well of the data. So in, in our predicted data, it actually is scaled uh, data, yeah. In the interest of time, we'll take one more question. <laughs> uh, very, fascinating, very fascinating talk, thank you. Uh, I'm Chi Shen from the University of Queensland. Uh, just out of curiosity, like, when people do the image classification or image recognition, they often do uh, data augmentation, like they crop the image or they rotate the image. Yeah. Can you also do the similar thing for the spatial transatomic data to improve the, like, yes. the robustness? Yes, we do a lot. So we do data augmentation, rotations, and adding noise. And uh, uh, we also do, um, like, yeah, as, as I mentioned, they do some normalization as well. So the data augmentation in neural network, I think, is very powerful in the, in the sense that it helps us to uh, reduce the impact of small sample size. Of course, uh, yeah, we still need big sample size, but with the uh, augmentation, it makes the model more robust. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thank you.